Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Before starting start uh, our session of this morning, I would like to invite you all to raise rise for a minute of silence uh, to honor the numerous victims of, um, of several terrorist attacks in the past weeks. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank His Excellency Trianish Jani, Ambassador of Indonesia and Chair of the ISIL Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee and the 1988 Sanctions Committee with whom we are jointly organizing today's special meeting. I am pleased to welcome the Deputy Executive Director of the Counterterrorist Committee, Executive Directorate, also known as ITET, Mr. Wei Chong Cheng, and the Coordinator of the Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team, Mr. Edmund Fitton Brown, as well as our honored guests and participants, and the many experts and organizations who are here today to share their experiences. Addressing the connections between organized crime and terrorists has long been on the agenda of the Security Council. Most recently, in Resolution 2462, the Council reiterated its concern that terrorists can benefit from transnational organized crime as a source of financing or logistical support and emphasized the need to coordinate efforts at the local, national, and sub-regional and international level to respond to this challenge. In that regard, the Council has also encouraged all participants and the United Nations to improve their understanding of the nature and scope of the links that may exist between terrorism and in, particularly, in particular terrorist financing and transnational organized crime. Our meeting today is designed to serve that specific purpose. Peru has made the linkages between organized crime and terrorism and the development of a, on a, of a more integrated and tailored responses, one of the priorities of our chairmanship in the Counterterrorism Committee. In April 2018, Peru, together with, with Cote d'Ivoire, France, and Kuwait, held during its presidency of the Security Council an area formula meeting on enhancing synergies between the United Nations and regional and sub-regional organizations in addressing this nexus. In May 2018, the Security Council adopted a presidential statement in which it noted that the nature and scope of the linkages between terrorism and transnational organized crime varied in context and requested that the joint special meeting at which we are gathered here today be held. While the open briefing on the nexus held by the CTC in October 2018 focused on the linkages between terrorism and three specific criminal activities, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and arms trafficking, arms smuggling, today's meeting will have a regional approach. Indeed, we believe that this joint special meeting will complement the discussions held at the open briefing by addressing the diverse regional specificity, responses, and lessons learned in dealing with that convergence which is greatly shaped by contextual factors. In that regard, our discussion will focus in four regions, Latin America, West Africa, Asia, and Europe, and will benefit from the perspective and contributions of states, academics, international and regional organizations. Tools and instruments developed in the context of combating organized crime may also contribute to the identification of terrorist networks, ensuring that integrated intelligence on criminal and terrorist activities is effectively processed is essential. 
we must also be sure to address these matters in a more coordinated manner. For instance, at the law enforce, enforcement and prosecutorial levels, we have seen the creation of joint investigative units and prosecution authorities. This is equally important and could also have a significant impact in the building on, on, of solid, solid criminal cases. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude by stressing that our responses to the terrorist threat must be comprehensive and coordinated, preventive and adaptable. This will enable us to the better identify those circumstances in which terrorists may benefit either directly or indirectly from their involvement in criminal activities or from their criminal connections. It is my hope that today's discussion will help further strengthen our understanding of those factors and vulnerabilities that may foster terrorist crime connection. I also hope that they serve to support all participants in their efforts to identify appropriate and good practices to address this threat. I encourage all participants and representatives of academia, regional and international organizations, and civil society to contribute actively to our discussion and to share their knowledge of and experiences with these critical issues. Thank you very much. I would la now like to warmly invite His Excellency Triancia Gianni, Chair of the ISIL Al Qaeda Sanchez Committee and the 1988 Sanchez Committee to take the floor. You have the floor. Ambassador. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Excellencies, distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by thanking His Excellency, my good friend, Ambassador Gustavo Meza Cuadra the chair of the Counterterrorism Committee for co-chairing this uh, very important event. I will, of course, join Gustavo in welcoming Deputy Executive Director of the Counterterrorism Committee, Executive Director, Citit, uh, Mr. Wei Xiong Chen, as well as the coordinator of the analytical support and sanction monitoring team, Mr. Edmund Fitton Brown, as well as our honored panelists and participants in, at our meeting. I would also like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to our colleagues at the CTED, the monitoring team, and the secretariats for their support in the preparation of this meeting. These events are an integral part of our engagement with the CTC and the CTED. The Security Council, as stipulated in Resolution 2368 of 2017, encourage such cooperation. And we aim to strengthen the partnership in order to accomplish our common objective. As just mentioned by His Excellency, the CTC Chair, the meeting today builds on the result of the open briefing on 8 October 2018. That particular event drew a wide response in the United Nations and the wider international expert community. I hope that the meeting today will contribute to a better understanding of the linkages between the international terrorism and organized crime, and therefore support more effective implementation of our respective mandates. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue of linkages between international terrorism and organized crime and ensuing threats to security have been on the agenda of the Security Council for many years. In particular, the Council has referred to the involvement of ISIL and Al-Qaeda in transnational organized crime in Resolution 2368 of 2017. In that resolution, the Council expressed concern that terrorists benefit from transnational organized crime in some regions, especially from the trafficking of arms, persons, drugs, and artifacts. From the illicit trade in natural resources, as well as from kidnapping for ransom and other crimes, including extortion and bank robbery. Moreover, as also mentioned by His Excellency the CTC Chair, this meeting today is the result of the presidential statement of 8 May of 2018, where the Council reiterated its concern about the close connection between international terrorism and transnational organized crime. 
and strongly encourage member states and relevant or regional, sub-regional, and international organizations to enhance cooperation amongst and between themselves. Dear colleagues, uh, I would like to emphasize that the topic of today's meeting is important for our committees. There are various fears on the nexus between terrorism and organized crime, in part due to the different experiences of countries and regions and how they confronted those threats. I hope that the discussion today will enhance our understanding of this phenomena. The analytical support and sanction monitoring team, which supports the 1267 and 1988 committees, pays close attention to possible linkages between the two phenomena. The monitoring team engagement with the intelligence community and security services of member states help produce up-to-date assessment of the threat of ISIL and Al-Qaeda and their involvement in other forms of crime. I'm sure that the coordinator of the monitoring team and the other experts present here will share their views on this subject. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that under the prevailing international security environment, a deeper understanding of the evolving threat of international terrorism and organized crime is necessary. In this regard, a more structured coordination and greater information sharing among our committees, other UN bodies, relevant international and regional partners will enable us to address these challenges in an effective way. Once again, I thank you for your presence here today, and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I thank His Excellency Ambassador Triancia Gianni for his important statement. And now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Wei Xiong Cheng, Deputy Executive Director of CITED. You have the floor, sir. Gracias, uh, Senor Presidente. Thank you very much, Chairman. The members of the committees, national and international experts, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Assistant Secretary General Michelle Connings, Executive Director of CTED, who is on an important assessment mission today. I welcome all of you to this joint briefing and echo the words of the Chair in confirming the importance attached uh, by CTED to better understanding the linkages between organized crime and terrorism. Over the past year, CTED has actively contributed to a number of international conferences, workshops, and expert meetings focused on the connections between organized crime and terrorism, including at the Council of Europe, GCTF, OSCE, EAG, and APG levels. In February, CTED issued a report on the relationship between human trafficking terrorism, and terrorism financing. CTED has also actively involved uh, the members of its global research network in the discussion on the terror crime nexus. As terrorists and criminal groups continue to adapt their operations in an effort to avoid detection, it is important that we have access to up-to-date information. We are therefore very grateful to our research network for its support. As recalled by the ASG and Executive Director in her intervention during last October's open briefing mentioned by the Chair just now, CTED continues to engage with national authorities and civil society, including within the framework of assessment visits on the understanding of the linkages between organized crime and terrorism, as well as on identified cases in which such linkages have been identified. Uh, these discussions uh, we will fed into the terrorism financing thematic summary gaps assessment that the Council in its recently adapted resolution 2462 requests CTED to carry out on an annual basis for the purpose uh, for facilitating the design of targeted technical assistance and capacity building efforts. 
Excellencies, the joint meeting today will enable researchers, member state practitioners, and representatives of international and regional organizations and civil society to offer their perspectives on the threat posed by the link between organized crime and terrorism as stressed by the relevant Security Council resolutions. We must promote comprehensive responses that are based on solid legal and institutional frameworks, as well as on the active and coordinated involvement of all relevant stakeholders. Effective capacity building is also key. We must work to overcome inter-institutional barriers to information sharing among institutions and interlocutors responsible for countering terrorism and those responsible for combating organized crime. We must also address the current limited use of financial intelligence and limited understanding of the factors and vulnerabilities that could foster the establishment of some forms of cooperation between criminal groups and terrorist entities, affiliates, and small cells. In the recently adopted addendum to the guiding principles on foreign terrorist fighters, uh, the CTC recalls the need to intensify and accelerate the timely exchange of financial intelligence, including with the view to effectively identifying uh, potential linkages between transnational organized crime and terrorism. The committee also invites member states to support initiatives and national mechanisms developed for this purpose. We are confident that today's dis discussions will be effectively built on the outcomes of the CDC open briefing on the same issue. The United Nations and international and regional organizations will play an important role in supporting member states in these efforts by promoting international cooperation, identifying possible trends and vulnerabilities, providing technical assistance, and developing or enhancing the relevant international or regional tools. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, rest assured that CETA will continue to make a full contribution to those efforts. Gracias. I thank the Deputy Executive Director Chen for his statement, and I would like now to warmly, warmly invite Mr. Edmund Fitton Brown, Coordinator of the Monitoring Team for 1267, 1989, and 2253 ISIL Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee to take the floor. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs, um, uh, esteemed participants. Um, I'm uh, honored and delighted to uh, speak on this important subject. Um, but uh, I stress I speak only within the terms of our 1267-1988 mandate. So my comments do not apply to non-1267 terrorist groups. Uh, the monitoring team reports on these issues regularly to the 1267 committee and takes every opportunity to seek member states' assessments of linkages between international takfiri terrorism and organized crime. The team intensified engagement on the subject in response to the PRST, which called for today's joint committee meeting. There are some manifestations of organized crime on which the team is specifically tasked to examine connections with ISIL and Al-Qaeda revenues, in particular crime involving illicit sale of oil, trafficking in cultural goods, and human trafficking, especially in relation to sexual violence and slavery. The team rarely uses the word nexus in this context because of the implication which it could carry of joint command and control. That said, on a macro level, in connection with the so-called uh, caliphate, it was obviously true that a criminal pseudo-state could only finance and run its terrorist business from the proceeds of organized criminality. There was joint command and control in this instance. Similarly, the Afghan Taliban, now I must stress, of course, that they are not defined as a terrorist group, 
but they used to be, and there are, there are some useful parallels, I think. We report on their reliance on narcotics revenues to finance themselves. Again, an organization cannot finance a national insurgency without resorting to organized criminality. When we ask member states for their views, we receive a wide range of responses. In Central Asia, North America, and Europe, the responses may be summarized as follows. Member states do not see much or anything in the way of linkages. And on the whole, they assess them to be unlikely because organized crime is profitable and would not risk its business model by engaging in activities or with individuals which would bring scrutiny from counterterrorism or agencies in addition to ordinary law enforcement agencies. At the other end of the spectrum, our 23rd report noted extensive connections between terrorism and organized crime in the Sahel and West Africa. Some terrorists in West Africa are also themselves organized criminals or close relatives of organized criminals. They're involved in kidnapping for ransom, extortion, trafficking of narcotics, smuggling of weapons, gasoline, vehicles, and automobile spare parts, as well as illegal mining. They need revenues from criminal activities, and they share with criminals the objective to weaken fragile states and undermine law and order, and also border security. In between these two contrasting scenarios, there are a number of examples that I will just um, pick out which may be helpful in today's debate. Although ISIL remains well-funded by previously obtained unspent assets, the monitoring team has current member state reporting to the effect that it is involved in extortion, possibly narcotics, in Iraq. It cooperates with traffickers, certainly, outside its ranks. It, can, it conducts kidnap for ransom operations, targeting local notables, especially in the Kirkuk uh, governorate. As of December 2018, ISIL still controlled some border checkpoints. They were able to smuggle weapons, ammunition, explosives, dual-use chemicals for IEDs, and also vehicles. We often report uh, in, a, in a whole range of uh, contexts linkages between crime and terrorism in terms of facilitators. So, for example, money launderers and facilities, smuggling and trafficking routes, for example. The general picture in the Middle East tends to be of this kind of overlap between organized crime and international terrorism. We have recent reporting of strong link local linkages between terrorism and organized crime in the Maldives. Terrorists consciously recruit from the ranks of criminals to the extent of co-opting whole criminal gangs to extremist ideology. There is a symbiotic relationship whereby the gangs supply capability and finance the terrorists and receive in return ideological validation, the redemption narrative, so-called, which we often see ISIL use to recruit individual criminals elsewhere. In conclusion, different forms of international terrorism require different forms and levels of funding. And the inhibition of organized criminals in engaging with terrorists varies between different arenas. There is a, maybe a sliding scale from a low cost inspired attack using a rental vehicle in Europe to a conflict zone insurgency. These are two very different things. ISIL was able to fund the so-called caliphate only through massive illicit economic activity. The Taliban have become the world's leading heroin producers. Interestingly, ISIL Khorasan province, the manifestation in Afghanistan, still appears to dislike the drug business, but they're happy enough to profit from illegal mining and, ext and other extractive industry activities. Crime and terrorism both involve breaking the law and using covert and illicit methods to do so. Some criminal facilitators, money launderers, traffickers of various kinds, are willing to work with whoever pays. Guns, drugs, people can use the same routes. The monitoring team is cautious about characterizing how these worlds intersect, but we are open to receiving evidence of something more systemic depending upon the variables which I've just described. 
and we strongly endorse the proposition that sharing of relevant intelligence should not be prevented by bureaucratic silos or departmental jealousies. Law enforcement agencies and counter-terrorism agencies must cooperate effectively and securely. Thank you. I thank Mr. Fiton Brown as well for his very informative uh, presentation, as uh, well as, again, His Excellency Francia Gianni, Ambassador, and the Executive Director, Mr. Chen, for very interesting and informative statements. I believe that we will have the opportunity to discuss several of the points raised in their interventions. Uh, I would like now to have a short pause, a few moments, to allow our next presenter to join us to the podium. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to open today's introductory session on the nexus between international terrorism and organized crime, definitions and scope of the issue, and to welcome our presenter, Ms. Florence Keen, Research Fellow at the Center for Financial Crimes and Security Studies, the Royal United Service Institute for Defense and Security Studies. Ms. Keen will will provide an overview of the types of interaction between organized crime and terrorism. She will also propose to consider a broad definition of crime in order to facilitate comprehensive discussion and analysis of different regional contexts. I'm pleased now to give the floor to Ms. Kin. You have the floor, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks particularly to UNC TED for inviting me here to speak at this event today. Um, I've been given the not so simple task of, of really trying to outline the numerous definitions and scope of this issue, um, which was certainly a challenge. There's no universally accepted definition of international terrorism, nor is there one for organized crime. And weaving the two together really only magnifies this problem. So today I'll just provide a brief taste of the academic and policy literature that's out there. Um, and just to say that's a brief one, um, even in just preparing for this today, I unearthed more and more important research that can really inform the debate going forward. And also before I begin, I just want to emphasise the nuance that should be applied to this topic. Terrorism and crime by their very nature are difficult to analyse and difficult to measure. And we should view the notion of a nexus somewhat with caution, bearing in mind that occasionally there are instances where connection exists that may be incidental and not necessarily indicative of a wider trend. Terrorist and criminal actors act in multiple ways, and we'll hear a lot more about that from various speakers today. But this still depends on actors, geographies, and political contexts. Uh, luckily for me today, I won't be personally coming up with a new definition but I will attempt to lay out how we got here and the various manifestations of this nexus, so that hopefully by the end of the day, we'll get a bit closer into defining what we mean by a crime terror nexus, and really more importantly, in my opinion, articulating how we can make this concept useful. If we can really determine where a nexus exists, then surely we should be able to determine useful disruption opportunities. I don't know where I'm pointing my... Uh Oh, there we go. Um, so I'll just briefly um, run through who Rusi is, who we are. Um, so as I said, I'm Florence Keane. I'm a research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. Um, we're a defence and security think tank founded in 1831, and we have offices in London, Brussels, and Nairobi. Um, and my team, the Centre for Financial Crime and Security Studies, really focuses on financial crime policy, both domestically and internationally. 
Um, a big focus on looking at the role of public-private partnerships and information sharing as a good way of disrupting financial crime. Uh, we run a program we call Financial Crime 2.0, which looks at the threats and opportunities of new technologies, um, which I'll touch upon later. And probably most relevant for this discussion, we run a um, program looking at the threat perspective of financial crime, from terrorism, organised crime... Oh, I think it's OK. Yeah. Um, proliferation finance and the illegal wildlife trade. Um, so today, I'll briefly look at how we came to the concept of a nexus, outline the various academic debates that exist on the topic, look at the problem, if I will, through the perspective of terrorist financing and how criminality intersects with this, and then really try and unpick the utility of the nexus and, and emphasise that this is context-dependent. Next slide, if possible. Yeah. Ah, perfect. So, how did we get here? I won't provide an exhaustive list of this, but I've tried to pick out a few of the notable developments, some of which have already been mentioned this morning. Beginning, of course, with Resolution 1373, um, which in the aftermath of September 11th noted the close connection between international terrorism, transna transnational organised crime, and listed a number of specific threats, including illicit drugs, money laundering, illegal arms trafficking, and the movement of nuclear, chemical, and biological materials. I also think it's worth quickly mentioning the role of the Financial Action Task Force here, or FATF. For those unfamiliar, the Financial Action Task Force was set up in 1989 as the international standard setter in combating the money laundering associated with the illegal drugs trade. Only in 2001, after 9-11, did its nine special recommendations um, add terrorist financing to the mandate. And it's just interesting, therefore, to note that from a threat finance perspective, the systems and structures that were set up to combat organised crime were applied to terrorism. Um, and whilst terrorist financing and money laundering are clearly extremely different beasts, the role of financial intelligence is a common thread between the two. And it's a tool that I'll elaborate on later, which is you know, particularly useful when considering this nexus between organised crime and terror. Jumping ahead some years to Resolution 2195 in 2014, which most explicitly urged UN member states to break the links between terrorists and transnational organised crime. Here, the list of threats by which terrorists can profit included the trafficking of arms, persons, natural resources, gold, precious metals, stones, wildlife, charcoal, oil, and kidnapping for ransom, to name a few. And it also really urged member states to implement the existing international conventions that related to terrorism and organised crime. Another one worth noting is uh, Resolution 2331 in 2016, which specifically encouraged the Financial Action Task Force and its regional star bodies across the world to look at the financial flows associated with the trafficking in persons that finances terrorism. This was uh, echoed in 2017 by the G20, who called upon countries to shut down alternative sources of terrorism finance and dismantle any possible connection between terrorism and organised crime. And following this, encourage the Financial Action Task Force and its regional bodies to deepen its understanding of the links between terrorism, finance, and human trafficking. And then, of course, we come to this year, in 2019, Resolution 2462, which was adopted by the Security Council, referencing its concern that terrorists can benefit from transnational organised crime as a source of financing. It not only pointed to criminal activity, but also the abuse of legitimate enterprise which is something, again, I'll touch upon later. It also noted the potential of new technologies and offered it as a risk of terrorist abuse. And there is perhaps a question we need to ask today about how the internet, cyber and dark web spaces may provide new opportunities for terrorists and criminals to interact. Numerous other international actors have prioritised this topic and commissioned research, which I've listed in the final bullet point below, um, and I won't go into too much detail on that now, but I will be discussing the Hague good practices that were developed um, after an initiative between Unicre and the GCTF. Next slide. Sorry, I can't see it from here. Perfect. So, 
the academic debate, which, as I've already noted, is broad, extensive, and it appears to be back um, on the agenda. In Bruce Hoffman's 1998 seminal book, Inside Terrorism, he stated that we should really always distinguish between terrorists and criminals, the latter of which are purely driven by material gain and not by public opinion. Here, Hoffman really looks at the, the topic through the motivations and not necessarily through the lens of methods, which, as many will argue, are becoming increasingly blurred. It was perhaps Tamara Makarenko's seminal paper in 2004 called The Crime Terror Continuum that really brought this nexus into common parlance. She argued that the end of the Cold War really brought about a decline in the sort of traditional methods that terrorists had used to raise money and sought upon using more and more criminal tactics to finance themselves. She described in detail on a continuum how criminal groups and terrorists learn from one another and adapt to each other's successes and failures, conceiving a continuum that at the far end of the spectrum manifested in simply alliance, meaning a level of cooperation around shared benefits and skills, for example, money laundering techniques or shared smuggling routes. The next stage further on in the continuum is operational motivations. Instead of cooperating with other groups, they described how organisations sought to acquire in-house skills to achieve their aims. So this would be terrorists using criminal tactics or vice versa. And the final point on the continuum that she described is full convergence. This refers to the idea that criminals and terrorists have essentially become one and the same thing, displaying characteristics of both simultaneously. And she also discusses the black hole syndrome, whereby a weak or failed and ungoverned state can foster this convergence between criminals and organised crime groups, providing a somewhat safe haven for this activity to flourish. Although regardless of where the group sits on the spectrum, she argued that our law enforcement response should focus on the criminal activity itself, and in particular on limiting a group's access to finance. In 2005, Louise Shelley and John Piccarelli continued on this theme, but instead of a continuum, they saw a spectrum in terms of methods and motivations of groups, beginning at first with simply appropriation, in which, like Makarenko, terrorists and criminals may imitate one another's methods. Then they wrote of a, me of a nexus that fostered business relationships between the two for efficiency reasons, such as outsourcing same skills, maybe using the same... Um, person for document forgery. The next step they termed as a symbiotic relationship, whereby groups naturally collaborate more and more regularly and their goals and methods begin to merge. The next stage she described was hybrid groups, in which the terrorist groups and criminals converge to a point where both act to have equal weighting within the group and they're dependent on one another for existence. And finally, they described full transformation in which, in some rare instances, they argue a group can become so focused on the activities on the other that its own motivation becomes secondary. In 2010, in Terrorism, Crime and Transformation, Chris Dishman has argued that there are some reasons where terrorist organisations will look much more like transnational crime groups, and this is when, essentially, they become more interested in profit than the political motivation itself. However, he was really keen to emphasise that terrorist organisations and crime groups do not cooperate in any shared sense of interest, but attempt to build in-house capabilities if they need to undertake either criminal or political acts. Um, I'll briefly mention the work of Rajan Basra and Peter Neumann. We're actually lucky enough to have Rajan here with us today in a later session, so I won't um, steal his thunder. But they've done some really important work looking at the convergence of crime and terror through the perspective of social networks, um, really revealing the ways in which the nexus manifests throughout the radicalisation process, where the role of prisons is important, and looking at the sharing of skills and experiences between the two groups, um, particularly around perhaps using petty criminality, which I'll touch upon later. And I think throughout this debate, we should keep this concept of crime in mind as we attempt to define the nexus. The activity clearly is not limited to international criminal and terrorist networks, and if recent years has taught us anything, it's that terrorist attacks are becoming cheaper and cheaper and often committed by domestic actors. Therefore, the criminal activity behind it is often low level, leaving a small financial footprint that needs to be understood. And sticking with the financial lens, Thomas Wren, an academic in 2018, argued that when viewed through this perspective, 
Um, there is no meaningful difference in distinguishing between criminal and terrorist actors, as so many have gone through convergence and transformation, although he does note that this is very much context-dependent. It's also worth adding balance to the, the debate. Um, not everyone is on board with the concept of a nexus um, in its current form. Phil, Phil Williams argued that the relationship has been, in fact, overhyped and really based on a confirmation bias where analysts attempting to look for a nexus will inev inevitably find one. But this can often lead to poor policy responses and perhaps wasted resources. He doesn't deny that cooperation exists when terrorists and criminal actors share a geographic space. They may use the same criminal methods. Um, but even says that just because two actors use the same means to avoid enforcement and intelligence agencies, this does not necessarily mean that they're cooperating with one another. Um, and he's also adamant that for the most part, criminal organizations are not drawn to working with terrorist organizations because the costs for them really far outweigh the benefits, except um, really arguing that those most interested in the crime terror nexus are those interested in threat inflation, um, which is perhaps too strong, but always interesting to hear the other side of the debate. It's safe to say the topic is broad. There's no one correct answer as to what the nexus is and how it manifests. And I think really it's not useful to try and find one definition, but to approach each situation uniquely, breaking down between the different actors, methods, and geographies in order to see if there are useful disruption opportunities. And in this next slide, I'm really going to try and break down between the, the various groups, um, specifically from the lens of terrorism finance, showing the myriad ways in which terrorists raise funds um, and you know, how we can best sit our response, um, which may seem like a really obvious point to do, but throughout my time researching terrorist financing, it's you know, very little that we see the kind of different groups and, and methodologies broken down in this way. I'd like to point out the diagram that I'll present is a simple version. Um, it, it rather just shows group actors and, di and the differences between them, um, and really just to demonstrate uh, the point of group actor, financial modus operandi, and law enforcement response. So beginning in the centre with al-Qaeda core, I guess, where many would argue that the terrorist financing regime came into place. This isn't strictly true, of course, but it is, as I mentioned earlier, where the FATF's nine special recommendations came into fruition. Um, and the fundraising mechanisms there that we saw were the use of charities, the use of donations, and a lot of money that flowed through the formal financial system. In fact, the 9-11 Commission report into financing revealed the tax cost between $400,000 and $500,000, 300000 of which passed through U US bank accounts. Um, which, of course, we see the response at the bottom in the terms of UN resolutions, asset freezes, and jurisdictions worldwide moving to ratify the 1999 Convention, countries criminalising the act of terrorism financing. And banks were placed really at the front line of this fight, which is understandable given the amount of money that went undetected through the formal financial system. And to this day, we really still see the private sector in particular and the banks tasked with detecting suspicious flows that may be related to terrorism. Uh, normally, I, normally this slide comes one by one, but I think it's, it's coming slowly. Anyway, so just to move on to the left of the screen in what we've termed here as corporate terrorists. And here we really see groups exhibiting methods that to all intents and purposes are a transnational crime organisation. There may be some level of state support, but for the most part, these groups will be really adept in criminal practices, such as drug trafficking, using illicit trade, um, and they may also use complicated money laundering techniques to hide their sources of wealth. In this regard, the most useful response may well look exactly like our response to an organized crime network, using anti-money laundering tools, sanctions, and targeted law enforcement action. So moving along just to the right, um, in the term that we've controlled, that we've described as territory controlling groups, um, which I think due to Islamic State has really been the form of terrorist actor and terrorism finance that has concerned the international community most in recent years. In such instances, these groups will rely heavily on organized crime tactics, um, which are, you know, really depend to a greater or lesser extent on how large the area it is that they control and the population they have underneath it. So with the so-called Islamic State, we saw great use of commodities, um, natural resources, and a heavy reliance on taxing and extorting the people within its own territory. 
The Abu Sayyaf group in the Philippines equally engaged in criminal tactics during the Marawi siege, engaging in kidnap for ransom, looting, and the illegal drugs trade. When groups become largely self-sufficient in this way, the financial disruption response, of course, looks very different. While anti-money laundering strategies and sanctions are still required, um, often the best tactic is trying to close the market off, isolate the group, um, and as with Islamic states, slash their resources by heavily targeting the oil fields. And then the final two sections on this slide that I'd like to highlight is the threat from small actor and small cell and lone actor terrorism, which may be directed by a group or it may merely be inspired. And looking at this form of actor and its connection or not to criminal methods is where the counter-terrorist financing regime is really challenged. There are many examples in recent years of loan actors and small cells using their own funds that may be legitimate, such as salaries or a spouse's income. They may use the welfare or domestic system in their own country. And as I said earlier, they may use petty crime methods to finance attacks. The crucial point with this form of terrorism is that the attacks are low cost or even no cost. Hiring a van to drive into pedestrians or purchasing a knife is unlikely to be flagged by a bank as suspicious prior to an attack, even if the actor is using a bank account, which is no guarantee. And in this scenario, we'd really like to emphasize that localized response which is required to understand how actors are radicalized and how they may interact with low level and petty crime. It really needs to be acknowledged that our ability to cut the funding off as though it were a tap is near on impossible. Instead, really focusing on financial intelligence um, in a post-attack scenario is where the real value in the counter-terrorist financing regime can come into place. With this, we can better understand who actors are and if there is a wider network at play. So, the relevance of the nexus, where does it sit? It's abundantly clear that terrorists will use criminal tactics to further their own aims. By understanding their different modus operandi, we may be able to find useful disruption points, so long as we are always contextualizing the risk. Financial intelligence is a common thread that can be utilized if it can shed light on both criminal and terrorist opportunities. For example, if a money service business is agnostic mover of money or an enabler in the service of both a transnational crime group and a designated terrorist group, there is a clear choking point. The same may be said with individuals or entities who provide forged identification documents. The providers of a service ultimately do not necessarily care, nor do they make the distinction between a terrorist or a criminal. And so if these are targeted successfully, we can remove a point in the chain. But for that to be possible, law enforcement agencies need to understand where the worlds of terrorism and crime interact. As previously said, the concept of the nexus can also be useful when considering disorganized and petty crime, both in terms of financial strategies, in terms of small terrorist acts, but also in terms of recruiting grounds, in understanding how terrorists acquire and justify their use of skills. Operations may also be disrupted using strategic interventions that target both groups, ensuring that criminals are constantly reminded of the cost of doing business with terrorists. To do this, really understanding how the crime terror nexus exists means not only thinking about law enforcement on the ground, but also connecting this through to prosecutors and judges. This was highlighted in Resolution 2322 in 2016, which explicitly called upon states to enhance cooperation to prevent terrorists from benefiting from transnational organized crime to investigate and build the capacity to prosecute terrorists, transnational organized crime groups, and working together. The nexus conception when thinking about a territory controlling group in terms of how we tackle it may be, yes, be useful. As I described in the slide earlier, in the case of Islamic State, when a group exploited the population to the extent that it did, whilst of course this was criminal activity, viewing the nexus and trying to disrupt it from the outside is often extremely difficult. And then considering if the academic Phil Williams earlier, who spoke about overhyping the relationship, had a point. I would certainly not go that far, but I would say there may be cases when attaching the word nexus to a crime type or a terrorist act may sometimes inflate the risk and perhaps distract us from the problem in hand. 
So I, I guess I would say being wary of, of creating links that may be incidental as opposed to being true evidence. I've conducted work recently looking at the role of virtual currencies, for example, in terrorism finance. Um, and this was you know, highly discussed in the media as potentially a new way in which terrorists were acting in a criminal way to raise funds and send money. But actually, when we investigated the problem further, we found that instances of this were extremely limited. This isn't to say that we shouldn't look at the problem and ensure that our regulation covers these points. But perhaps in the grand scheme of terrorist financing, this was not the risk that it was first perceived to be. So I guess I'd question, how do jurisdictions really prioritise the risks versus the realities when it comes to organised crime and terrorism and the nexus, when there are so many criminal act methods that a terrorist actor may use? And I think really the recent trend in countries producing their own risk assessments on terrorist financing is a really good place to begin, in which countries can take a much more nuanced and risk-based approach to the risk that they face. And finally, to summarise the way forward, um, it's a very broad topic, but at least from our perspective, we certainly see value in the nexus based upon this broad range of policy and academic literature that currently exists. As I've said many times, the utility of the nexus will only be realised if we recognise the interactions between criminals and terrorists are multifaceted and depend on the variables that exist in geography, politics and time. Unless we do this, the concept of a nexus becomes meaningless. We must use it with a clear purpose in mind, and it's ultimately of most value when it can lead to opportunities for law enforcement intervention, in particular at this operational level to target the common enablers. As has already been mentioned, today is a good opportunity to think about expanding the definition to look at crime in a broader sense, that it's not just organised but often low level. Um, and really trying to understand that despite this, the terrorist activity connected can still be deadly. Therefore, it's a very important topic to continue. I briefly mentioned the Hague Good Practices as a really important detailed document that I'd urge you all to read um, to consider how this can be incorporated better into policy responses. Um, and also the recently published toolkit, which looks at legal considerations. It talks about more research. Of course, as a researcher, I would say that. Um, that avoids duplicating efforts but really focuses on topics that could be better understood, particularly around illicit or shadow economies and the informal systems where the nexus thrives. Information sharing is another really crucial part of the good practices, looking at the connection between public-to-public -public agencies and, of course, public-to-private sectors at a local, national and regional level. This is really based upon the recognition that actors hold different pieces of the puzzle as relates to crime and terrorism. But when put together and the appropriate legal mechanisms are put into place, we can see a much clearer picture of this crime type. Private sector actors in particular can be beneficial, and this should include banks, accountants, lawyers, and even new technology companies to really understand the landscape. In the UK, this exists already in the form of the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, but there are other versions in different countries on specific threats, such as in the Netherlands on terrorism financing. It's important to always stress the, the need for local engagement between state and non-state actors. Any strategy that wants to continue looking at the nexus must engage with civil society and local communities, particularly when considering the social network side of the nexus and the connection to low-level and petty crime. And of course, where appropriate, crime and terrorism agencies should collaborate together on shared threats. This requires the necessary, necessary skills and training, particularly financial capabilities. Making use of national financial intelligence units should be prioritised, and jurisdictions can really prioritise this as an important tool. So I'll round up there. I think um, it's difficult to summarise in a 20-minute slot, and there's clearly just an overwhelming policy focus and academic debate on the crime terror nexus and understandably so. Here it's just really important not to lose sight of the ultimate question, how does understanding the nexus contribute to our counterterrorism efforts? If we become vague about the nexus and we overstretch it, it's not really a particular, uh, not, it's not a good lens through which to look at either. But if we truly disaggregate the threat in its proper context, context, it can be an extremely beneficial tool. So thank you again for inviting me today and I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much, Ms. Keen, for your very interesting and informative introductory briefing.
I will open the floor for question and answer in relation to her intervention at the end of the session one. So I invite Ms. King to remain on the podium. Uh, we will now continue with four regional panel discussions and one final panel discussion. But before we proceed to our next discussion, I would like to draw your attention to a few important housekeeping matters. Please note that this event is being broadcasted live CTED will be live tweeting all day using the hashtag Terror Crime Nexus. So please feel free to retweet a UN CTED or tweet using the hashtag Terror Crime Nexus. Following each discussion, we will open the floor for security members and other participants of the audience to raise questions, comments, or statements in their national capacity. Uh, we have a very full uh, day agenda for today. I would like to kindly ask all participants to be mindful of the time limits uh, and to limit their intervention to three minutes. So that will allow us to hear from all the presenters uh, guests today. Uh, now, uh, well, for interventions, uh, please wait for the red line and we will now move to the first session focusing on Latin America which uh, I will be moderating also, and I would like to warmly invite panelists for the first session to come to the podium. I would like to warmly welcome our, our panelists. In the first place, uh, our first panelist, Mr. Juan Belikov, fellow Argentine Council for International Relations. So I'll give the floor to Mr. Belikov. You have the floor now. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'll be speaking in Spanish, just so that I don't uh, offend anybody with my terrible English. When I was invited to participate on this panel, I was surprised because I'd been working on this for 30 years and I was surprised that someone wanted to delve into this issue because it is particularly complicated. And I was therefore very impressed by that. Now, very briefly, I would just like to introduce the situation that we have in Latin America and the Caribbean, particularly in Latin America. Currently, it is the most violent region in the world. It is the only, of the sub, only one of the sub-regions in the world in which homicide rates are increasing and violence rates are increasing. And um, we represent 7.8% eight percent of the world's population however we represent around 30 percent of homicides and around 70 percent of uh, kidnapping for extortion 30 percent of our homicides are due to organized crime Another of the characteristics that marks our region is that it is the region that is home to the greatest number of diaspora in the world we have the second and third largest concentration of Japanese people outside Japan. We have more Palestinians than in Palestine in our region. We have enormous immigration from all corners of the earth. This is therefore a very multicultural region. And this is a great advantage for us in all ways and it really is very enriching. However, it's also true that in situations of crisis, 
when, for example, we are facing unemployment, natural disasters, financial crises or economic crises, this opens the door for certain groups to seek to radicalize people that feel that they have no opportunities. So I'll move on to my next slide. I wanted to go to the previous slide. There we are. When we talk about the nexus between organised crime and terrorism, we're talking about all of this. Um, you might not be able to see everything that's on the screen. That's not by accident, because many of the issues are invisible due to the complex nature of the problem. This is the universe of what I would call organised crime. It includes organised crime and terrorism, uh, mafia and corruption. All of these phenomena coexist. What you can see here are simply the factual manifestations of these. But to have a true understanding of the program there would be no suitable flowchart because it concerns the combination of all of these activities and all of the potential combinations that you might think of between all of these phenomena that aren't necessarily set out on the screen. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the nexus between transnational organised crime and terrorism. And what we're talking about here is simply the tip of the iceberg, the visible part. But when you go deeper, the roots really are very, very deep. All we can simply see is the surface. When you dig below the surface, many of the lines that you'll see uh, on this screen aren't necessarily visible. A philosopher on crime in our region you used a sentence where he referred to either silver or lead. Silver refers to uh, um, crime and lead to terrorism. Now, now, lead is so cheap that it reduces the cost of silver. What do I mean by that? Well, today, for $300 in our region, you can order the, the killing of someone. So it, you don't need to pay them off because it's cheaper to kill them. That's what we're talking about here. Now, moving on to our next slide. And thanks to the previous presentation, I won't need to go into some introductions because they're quite long. But I just wanted to show you what we're talking about. When we talk about organized crime and terrorism, in truth, we're talking about two phenomena that in our view, are ideal models that don't necessarily exist in the real world. What does that mean? Well, on the one hand, we have organized crime and terrorism on the other side. But these don't exist because actually they're just on a whole scale of grey. For example, once you no longer have sponsoring terrorist sponsoring states, if they ever existed, terrorism has needs organized crime for its training, operations, equipment, etc. These are activity criminal activities that fund terrorist organizations, and these criminal activities are simply no longer organized crime. Taking the the other model, where there is no terror within organized crime, criminalized crime groups do use terror to carry out their work. Anyone who's a member of a criminal organized gang knows that speaking has a cost, and this is what we technically call terror. And here I would note that terrorism is nothing more than tactics. Anyone could use it, any group could use it. And that's why I'm talking about this scale of grey between both phenomena. It can come from the political sphere, from business, it can come from trades unions. 
or from religious organizations, wherever you like. Any organization could be involved in this. I'll simply, it, it, they are just a part of a continuum between these two issues. We started to see this arising within the 90s, and this is simply a development of that. So we face these issues in the real world. We look at where these types of groups can cooperate. They can cooperate, for example, through mere associations, but they can also uh, cooperate through partnerships in which some of their components are intermixed because they share interests and activities. Um, we then have a level of convergence that is actually more complicated still, in which the groups for tactual ta reasons or other reasons decide to incorporate within their groups certain cells that are related to involved in related activities for example you have terrorist groups with criminal organizations within them and vice versa for example a human trafficking group needs for example for the migratory authorities to turn a blind eye to their activities and they would therefore be using uh, another group to overcome this. And then we also have uh, mafia groups and I won't be dwelling on that because that's a whole different issue. Now beyond this system we have other issues, for example uh, isolated terrorists, but we can also have within the political system some people that are involved in criminal activities that fall outside this nexus. I won't be dwelling on that either, because the reality is that we deal with all of these with three different instruments, because terrorism, mafia, and organized crime uh, is if they were all separate, but it, the reality is that they're all involved in this terrorist, terrorism, organized crime nexus. As we heard previously, everybody addresses this differently, and um, believing that these are mutually exclusive phenomena, but they're not. Therefore, it's essential that when, when we see actors, for example, behaving as non-state actors, the ability of the state to confront this non-state actor is different to when they address, for example, when they are addressed by, for example, vulnerable states. So these non-state actors, for example, don't want to cross someone from the state, and so they avoid them when they act. Well, now, these criminal groups meet, come across the state in certain areas, for example, in cargo transport, passenger transport, or uh, transport from different areas uh, where uh, one group has control, etc. Now, we can also talk about the level of a, having a weak state where there are para-state para actors, and they generate a type of state within a state. We've also seen that type of group. Now, finally, we have a failed state where these groups act as a-state groups because they take away the ability of the state to exist. These components are relevant because they involve different types of reaction from the state. Now, when we're talking about a sensitive state, basically the state contains the three elements that need to coexist to respond to these issues. On the one hand, it has an appropriate legal framework, it has political will, and it has the institutional capacity to resolve it. Um, now, when you move on to the vulnerable state level, some of one of the three levels is failing. For example, there isn't an, a legal framework, there isn't the political will, or there isn't institutional capacity. Then when you look at the level of the weak state, what we see is the lack of two of these three elements, and then when you reach the level of the failed state, none of these elements is present. Now, this is a clear simplification, but what I mean by this is that within one territory, you can have the coexistence of different groups working with different dynamics and different state capacity to address them, depending on the territory or thematic area. Finally, I wanted to show this last graph that 
with the World Bank and the UN, we've been working on a study on the institutional capacity as a proportion uh, of the homicide rate. We've taken the examples of three countries, uh, Southern Cone, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. Then we have the Southern Triangle of Central America. That's Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Panama. And then we have the Northern uh, Triangle of Central America. Now, as you can see, the institutional capacity as a proportion of the rate of homicide, depending on the region, does differ significantly. For example, the work of if you can the 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 man on the pie chart with a magnifying glass represents how many detectives there are solving crime in the area then you have prosecutors judges members of the police etc when you look at the asymmetries among the res between the response capacities of different countries you can see that we're not necessarily talking about the quality of the response but rather the coverage we can't pretend that a country in which on average a prosecutor has to address around four or hundred homicides per year can truly resolve this crime or in all of the cases that come before him. Now, in closing my presentation, I think that three pillars of the state response are ensuring political decision making and determination in letters but also in numbers. The second aspect that I wanted to underscore is institutional capacity. We have a series of very serious problems. Some of them have already been mentioned, exchange of information, intelligence about transactions. It's not enough to simply monitor financial transactions. We need to look at recruitment, mobility, training, equ equipment, etc. All of these transactions, all of these issues are transactions in which we need to intervene and we need to look at how we can disrupt them in the most appropriate way. We have institutional agility and response times, responding to the challenges. We also have to adopt our technology and ensure that we have appropriate doctrines. We should make headway in specialisations, uh, in coverage and satur saturation. We should promote joint activities as well. Here we're not talking about coordination. Coordination, in my view, is a dead concept because everybody wants to coordinate but no one is coordinated and coordination basically means that we do the same thing but without actually working together. Here we need to look at how we can articulate the uh, activities of one and the other and really m work together. In our region, joint work has borne good fruit in different areas and here I'm not simply about talking about the security and justice sectors, but also prevention, provision, resilience building. And we should also include rehabilitation services and penitentiary services because they have the most intelligence on terrorists and organised groups, uh, criminal groups. We also should be working on a holistic approach because we can't separate terrorism from organised crime because it's on one continuum. The groups continue to change depending on a response. For example, a non-state group, if it sees a weak state, might become an anti-state group. But if the ability of the state improves, it will move from being a non-state act a group. And therefore, the response capacity needs to adapt because if the logic of the group changes, we might be necessarily we might be using an an outdated approach. We also need to ensure that we have a legal framework. I won't be dwelling on that because I believe that we're going to be going into that later on. So that's all I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Belikov, for your presentation. And I would now like to welcome Mr. Eduardo, Eduardo Camargo, who is from, the, from Colombia. Uh, Mr. Jimenez Camargo, prosecutor in charge of financial crimes from the Office of the Attorney General. You have the floor. Okay, I'll do my presentation in English. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Um, let's see if this works. Yes. So I think that my two colleagues here have addressed um, the question of the nexus between organized crime and terrorism in a very broad manner. 
Um, I think it's quite convenient that my presentation is the last one because I'll show you the evidence from our office of such nexus. Um, in a very brief manner, the first thing I'll do is give you a little bit of the Colombian context uh, from which um, we, we can take many examples. I'll just bring one of them at the end. The second one is the role of the Attorney General's office um, fighting this type of criminality and the way we do it and the new approach that we're doing. And the third one is um, the case example uh, that I want to show you. First, Colombian context. Well, um, some of my colleagues here uh, has mentioned one of these guys, Pablo Escobar. Sadly, uh, we have a lot of history related to drug trafficking, and most of our um, efforts and the, the 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 way that the law enforcement community has seen Colombia has been concentrated mostly on drug trafficking. Nevertheless, in the last years, we have gotten better um, fighting other types of criminality. And this context is comprised of not only drug trafficking, but also organized crime, terrorist organization, illicit mining, and later on, we have been also focusing on trade-based money laundering as a way of bringing to the country the proceeds of drug trafficking and other illicit activities. Um, the role of the Colombian AG's office, um, we are part of the judicial branch, we are part of the judicial branch, and uh, understanding that we cannot fight criminality in the same way that we have been doing. On 2017, we went through a restructuring process in which um, the main sections of our institution were divided in three. The first one related to citizen security, petty crimes, homicides, and so on. The second one focusing on organized crime, terrorism, um, human rights, narcotics, and other. And the third one, which is the one I lead, uh, which is called the Section Against Illicit Finances. I am in charge of three sections in the AG Suffrage, which is the first one, the Money Laundry Section, the second one is the Asset Forfeiture Section, and the third one is called the Financial Investigations Unit. Um, we are a small team of around 500 people, but our main focus is not only on financial crimes, but the prosecution of the illicit proceeds of the other activities in crime. So the example I, I come to bring you, and, and I hope I have more time, but, but in, in here will be very explicit, is the case of illicit mining. In here we can see many of the things that my colleagues here have addressed and expressed, uh, either from the academic debate or that the use of terrorism as a way of, um, as, as, a, as a means of organized crime. Illegal mining is a problem that uh, we've seen it mentioned in the, in, the, um, in the UN resolutions in other parts of the world, but Latin America is suffering very, very much from the, from the problem of illicit mining. Illicit mining understood as the way of extracting, and in this case it's gold, um, in a way that damages the environment, the rivers, and the jungle. In the first part on the left of the presentation, you can see that we have the extraction. And in here, normally the mines are controlled by either organized armed groups or either they participate or sponsor or they collect what it's called a tax to these illegal activities in the jungle. In here we have extortion, in here we have illicit extraction, and in here we have also corruption. The second part is the trading, the internal trading, because that gold that is taken out of the jungle by illicit means, by destroying our rivers, it has to be traded. So in here we start the money laundering process. The gold is real, but we need to, we need to sell it to someone. We need to see how we can start introducing this into the formal economic activities. So in here we have seen and we have documented many cases of the forgery of documents, the incorporation of companies that actually don't exist, and also some corruption. This is the second phase. This is the internal phase in which we start seeing those links between these armed groups and organized crime. Why? Because in the end, the approach is economical. Organized crime or organized groups, they need to work as a working entity. In the end of the day, they need to, they need to pay the salaries of the people that are in, within these organizations, either it's organized crime or the other ones. So here one is one of the first phases in which 
we have documented that and I'll show you in some pictures. And the third part is, of course, the exporting of that gold as a legal activity. However, the question that we have arised in our investigations is where is the gold coming from? Because these companies are big, these companies are not based in, uh, uh, in um, regions of the country where it is difficult to arrive, but they, are, they, are, uh, they work on the main cities of the country. And the problem of illegal mining has become a um, more profitable way of financing either organized crime activities or terrorist activities than drug trafficking. You see here in my presentation on the right that a kilo of gold in the spot market can be, uh, can, uh, can, can be as uh, much as 42 US dollars. A kilo of cocaine in the streets of New York may be in or about 36,000 US dollars. And different from cocaine, where the problem is how do I bring the money to the country, the export of gold doesn't have that problem. The money comes back through the financial system, so you have, you have already laundered the money. And if you go back in the chain, well, these people have already a very organized structure in which way doing that. So it, this is a bit of a problem. Um, and, and some countries as well, um, have unregulated markets for the purchase and sale of gold. So for instance, if I arrive to, let's say, the United States, to Florida, with $100,000 in my bag, I'll have a lot of trouble. If I arrive with gold, it doesn't happen. It's an unregulated market. So this is just one example that of, of, of the investigation we made very quickly. In here, we had um, the, the exporter, the exporter, it was located in the city. And here we had a gold provider in a very, uh, in a region of the country. And here we had an indigenous reserve because uh, according to tax records that we found, those people were allegedly selling gold. Uh, here we had a, a different provider. And uh, here we had another gold, alleged gold provider. And in here, it was the accounting company of this exporting uh, company. These people moved a lot of money, as you can see. Uh, they tell me I have two minutes, and I'll show you the evidence. So what we find in the exporting company, of course, gold. It's real. They are exporting that gold. They have very fancy offices. But the question is, who sold that gold to these individuals? So we found three companies, Colombian Mining, that is the Majan Saz and Mining Group Company. These companies reported to the tax authority to have sold uh, gold by $82 million, $115 million, and $85 million. Do you want to see what we found when we go after them? This is what we found. Another example, gold and silver. They allegedly moved 62 million US dollars. Look how gold and silver looks. And of course, organized crime and terrorist organizations are the world controlling this. They just incorporate a company. This is the accounting company that made the accounting of $936 million. And where does the gold come from? In the first part that I show you, these are real pictures. The one on the left is of a Peruvian um, river. The one on the right is from Colombia. And in here we can see, well, all of that destruction I was telling you about. These particular areas of the country are, of course, very far away. And in, a, in order to be there, you need um, some sort of nexus between organized crime and terrorist organizations like the ones we unfortunately have in Colombia. Uh, thank you very much. I thank Mr. Camango for his presentation. Our next presenter will join us via VTC. I would like to welcome Ms. Maria Fernanda Sarmiento, Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism from the Organization of American States. Are we connected? We're waiting for the connection with Washington. So, uh, Ms. Maria Fernanda Sarmiento, welcome to our discussion. You, you have a floor if you hear us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, it's okay. Okay. So, His Excellency Gustavo Mesa Cuadra, Chair of the Counterterrorism Committee, 
His Excellency Mr. Diane Triasiag Jani, Chair of the ICL Al Qaeda Sanctions Committee and Chair of the Security Council Committee. It is my honor to address you on behalf of the Inter American Committee Against Terrorism of the Organization of American States on this important occasion. I would like to thank the Chair of the Counterterrorism Committee for inviting the OAS to participate in this relevant meeting. Today's topic of discussion, the nexus between international terrorism and transnational organized crime, has become one of the major challenges facing our region. The Secretariat of Multidimensional Security through the Inter-American Committee Against Terrorism, CICTE, has been active in enhancing the coordination among countries in the Americas to strengthen a global response to the serious threats to international peace and security posed by terrorist acts and transnational organized crime. The OAS encompasses 35 countries total, as diverse in geography as in the security-related challenges we face, from localized criminal activity to sophisticated transnational criminal networks that traffic drugs, weapons, people, and illicit goods and materials both throughout the region and to and from other parts of the world. While the majority of our member states have largely avoided the direct impact of groups like ISIL, Al-Qaeda, or their affiliates, it is widely understood that many of the vulnerabilities and gaps exploited by, by criminal organizations are equally susceptible to exploitation by terrorists. Existing weaknesses, such as undetectable movement of terrorist organization members due to porous borders, links with established drug trafficking organizations that provide large quantities of cash, links with organized criminal organizations' activities, weak or inefficient legal frameworks to counter terrorism, and the use of alternative money remittance systems are some of the weaknesses exploited by terrorist groups in certain geographical areas of the region. In Latin America and the Caribbean, the security challenges posed by transnational organized criminal activity take greater precedent than the threat of an act of terrorism. But it is also widely understood, especially in the law enforcement and security communities, that a security gap that enables the movement of large quantities of drugs or other illicit items over land or by sea or air could also be used to move materials intended for a terrorist attack. Furthermore, the routes and methods by which people are trafficked or money is moved could also enable the movement across borders of people planning to commit an act of terrorism or even use the profits of transnational criminal activities as a source of funding to finance an act of terrorism or a terrorist organization. These organizations have diversified their sources of funding through narcotics, trafficking, and other illicit activities, establishing strong alliances with transnational criminal groups operating in the region. In addition, there is a growing evidence that some of the drivers of organized criminal and gang activity throughout the Americas, including persistent poverty and social and political instability, share important parallels with the drivers of violent extremism that is conducive to terrorism. The linkages between organized crime and terrorism in our region are numerous, and they could be summarized as follows. The most common money laundering predicate offenses in the region are illicit drug trafficking, illicit trafficking in stolen goods, migrant smuggling and trafficking in human beings, corruption and bribery, and environmental crimes. All of these different forms of criminal activity constitute potential funding sources for terrorist organizations. Certain geographical pockets throughout our hemisphere are generating increasing concern about the profits from criminal activities being funneled to terrorist groups, namely Lebanese Hezbollah. We are equally concerned with uh, securing the movement of people and goods across borders, which is particularly challenging given the geography of the region. The same is true of the vast waters of the Caribbean, which are extremely difficult to secure. Countries in our hemisphere require improved access and control and container inspection techniques at seaports and increased capacities of border and migration personnel to identify 
travel document for and increased information sharing and analysis, including the use of API and PNR and tools like Interpol, stolen and lost travel document databases. Currently, CICTA's 12 terrorism prevention uh, programs assist OAS member states in the design and implementation of government policies and strategies to improve their counterterrorism cap capabilities. In this regard, CICTA's programs are focused on supporting OAS member states to amend existing le legislation and enact new laws and regulatory frameworks to comply with international standards the Inter-American Convention Against Terrorism, the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, and relevant UN Security Council resolutions. Strengthen international and regional cooperation and information sharing cooperation between key agencies, including border control authorities, customs officials, and other national law enforcement agencies. Expand criminal investigations and prosecutions to include the use of intelligence as admissible evidence and special Im investigation techniques and put in place appropriate mutual legal assistance and extradition mechanisms. Combat the use of the internet for terrorist purposes. Transnational criminal groups and terrorist groups exploit the same vulnerabilities that have made the internet a strategic tool for the operations and financing of terrorist groups including to recruit or train new members to collect and transfer funds, to organize terrorist acts, or to spread propaganda and incite others to violence. Our region has made notable progress in addressing many of these issues, but much remains to be done. The fight against terrorism and transnational crime organizations requires increased information and intelligence sharing, the development of global cooperation and coordinated actions among competent agencies. Counter-narcotic and counter-terrorism agencies should be alert to the signs of possible linkages among the two groups. The role of regional organizations should be instrumental in supporting national, sub-regional and regional efforts to adopt counter-terrorism strategies as well as tackling the linkages between terrorism and transnational organized crime. Last, those of us in regional and international organizations working on these issues have a key part to play supporting states as they try to better understand and manage evolving security challenges. We need to work together to better improve cooperation among countries and coordinate our efforts for the ultimate objective of reducing criminal and terrorist activities. Thank you. I thank Ms. Sarmiento and indeed all our panelists for their remarks. We will now open the floor for questions or comments regarding this session as well as the introductory session by Ms. Kim. I would like to first give members of the Security Council the opportunity to raise questions or comments then to all participants. Would any security member, council members like to take the floor? Uh, I give the floor to the representative of France. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone, and great thanks to uh, all of the panelists uh, that we heard this morning. They're very good briefings that they gave. It's a very interesting topic, and as you said, it uh, was mentioned by the Security Council uh, for a number of years now. And France, as well, uh, welcomes all the initiatives that have been taken to try to better understand the question of the nexus between terror and crime. Uh, some said it, others said it this morning, but for us, this uh, nexus uh, is a phenomenon which is complex and multifaceted, and uh, its manifestations vary in different contexts. It has been demonstrated quite clearly. But sometimes, uh, some terrorist groups might rely uh, in an opportunistic fashion on criminal uh, groups uh, for f financing or recruitment. Still, terrorism can also provide, in some regions, provide uh, fertile ground for different types of criminal activity. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Europe this afternoon, so I won't go into it in detail, simply to say that for us, 
uh, there's not much uh, true uh, cooperation between uh, terror and crime that we've seen in the last few years, but at the same time, elsewhere in the world, particularly in regions where uh, the state territory is contested by criminal groups, in those cases the linkages can be stronger and could result in uh, more active cooperation. We'll talk about uh, West Africa and Sahel also in uh, later on. So I just have a question, maybe for Florence Keane, whose uh, briefing was very interesting. Thank you very much. It has to do, uh, you mentioned the need for authorities in charge of counterterrorism and against crime, that those two groups cooperate more, uh, that they exchange information, in particular financial data. In your opinion, in the cases that you're aware of, what are the major obstacles to this cooperation and how uh, could we do more uh, to bring down the barriers when we have to between the two groups? Thank you. I thank the representative of France. Representative of China. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for convening today's meeting. My gratitude also goes to all presenters for their briefings and views lately. Frequent terrorist incidents in many parts of the world have caught the close attention of the international community. Terrorists are employing more cruel tactics. Terrorist groups use internet and social media for purposes such as incitement and recruitment. They are also converging with organized crimes, engaging in transboundary arms and drug smuggling and trafficking of the persons and, in, and illicit exploitation of natural resources and trade for raising funds. The activities jeopardize sovereign to relevant countries and regional stability aggravate spillover effects of domestic conflicts, thus posing a serious and real threat to international peace and security. Security issues, including terrorism, have the pronounced features of being interconnected, transboundary, and varied. Security gaps in any country can cause the inflow of a multitude of external security risks resulting in an area of concentrated security risks. The accumulation of security issues in any country when reaching a certain level will spill over to become regional or even global security issues. Faced with a grim counterterrorism landscape, the international community should engage in closer cooperation, implement relevant security council resolutions in earnest, enhance information and intelligence exchange, and share good practices. It is also imperative to pay attention to the use of internet and other ICTs by terrorist groups, step up cooperation with specialized UN bodies, help relevant countries build capacity in sectors such as border control, customs management, and drugs control. We should take actions in unison, effectively combat terrorism and transboundary organized crimes and sever their nexus in a joint effort to safeguard international peace and security. With regard to Latin American region, China supports regional countries in strengthening cross-border cooperation in tackling terrorism and transboundary crimes and supports relevant Latin American regional and sub-regional organizations in playing an important role. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I thank the representative of China. Give the floor to the representative of Belgium. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, to all panelists for the uh, interesting briefings they gave, very complete. Belgium, as well, has observed that the last few years especially, there are linkages uh, between uh, organized crime and terrorism. So first of all, in terms of profile, we have found that at least two-thirds of the terrorists that have participated in the uh, 22nd of March 2016 attacks have a criminal record. Uh, the crime profile varies. There, is, there are exceptional or large crimes and more like misdemeanors. And we also found that uh, prisons are places to meet people. Uh, criminals meet terrorists. And so that creates opportunities uh, of cooperation. And we found that criminals and terrorists recruit very often uh, from among the same population. In terms of financing terrorism, uh, some terrorist groups have huge budgets which uh, come from uh, organized crime, but we also uh, have to bear in mind that Daesh ha has also encouraged uh, attacks uh, more, that are more costly in Europe, so we also have to know that uh, it's sometimes it's not necessary 
to find a lot of money. They've encouraged the tax, not very costly, pardon me, uh, but also uh, there is a synergy among uh, criminal past and moving into terrorism, and it often is linked to the uh, indoctrination of Daesh. Uh, there's a, a redemption or legitimization course uh, for crimes, which means it pushes the criminals into terrorism using that path. And that's the problem that I wanted to, to address when I asked my question for Ms. Keene in particular, because you mentioned this type of, cr of criminal and terrorist in your presentation. What are the challenges for the authorities in uh, fighting against this phenomenon, the synergy that exists between the criminal past and becoming a terrorist, having to do with redemption and legitim legitimization of crime, often offered by groups like Daesh? Thank you. Thank you to Belgium. More Security Council members, request for the floor. I will open to questions and comments from all participants. I have the request from the Ambassador of Argentina. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Gracias. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for convening this debate and including a regional focus within it. I would like to congratulate this morning's panelists for their contributions. Although Argentina recognizes the existence of a nexus between terrorism and organized crime, traditional organized crime, we can't take up, leave this opportunity to reiterate that both phenomena are regulated by different international legal frameworks and both particularities or specificities should be respected. At a regional level, the Republic of Argentina supports training and information exchange and good practices uh, initiatives within the OAS that we promoted in 1998. Now, with regard to the review of the Global Cancer Terrorism Strategy in 2016, Argentina has sought to implement this in a balanced way. For example, under Pillar 1, we have strengthened our legislation with regard to the rights and guarantees for the protection of the rights of victims in order to provide them with counselling, legal representation, protection and access to justice. And here I would like to ask the panellists something. From your perspective, what is the situation in the region with regard to the gathering of data pertaining to organized crime and the impact that that has to ensure an assessment of the current scenario and develop specific strategies to address this issue. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'd like to thank the Argentine ambassador for his intervention. Now to representative of the Netherlands. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you very much for organizing this open briefing. Also, thanks to, to CTAD. It's an important topic. And we're looking forward to uh, the ways in which you will take the outcomes of this meeting forward in the Counterterrorism Committee and within the Security Council. Um, it's also a topic that's close to our heart. Um, as was already mentioned, uh, within the Global Counterterrorism Forum, uh, the Netherlands took the initiative together with Unicre to develop good practices on how to address the nexus. And I'm also happy with the references so far uh, to the toolkit that Unicre has developed as a follow-up to those good practices. And we have a very long day ahead of us, but I recommend everyone to stick around uh, until 5 p.m. when Unicre will talk more about um, this toolkit. Um, I also have a question to Ms. Keen, and thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Um, I saw that you've done research on public-private cooperation in countering the financing of terrorism. And I was wondering from that or other research, um, if you could say something about the obstacles to public-private cooperation in addressing the nexus um, and ways to overcome those obstacles. Thank you very much. I thank the representative of the Netherlands. I have one request from the representative of Brazil. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank the panelists for their presentation. Um, Brazil agrees with the assumptions of this meeting 
that the nature and scope of the linkages between terrorism and transnational organized crime will vary by context, as stated in the presidential uh, statement of the Security Council last year and as stated by some of the panelists. And, and this is even more true when we are discussing a specific region, such as Latin America, uh, where we must always keep in mind that each country will face uh, very distinct challenges. We have very s different situations on the ground. Uh, legal frameworks are different, and also the political institu institutions will vary a lot as well. Um, so um, we also agree with some uh, panelists when they say that there are no automatic connections between transnational organized crime and terrorist organizations. So. Uh, our first word of caution would be on avoiding, avoiding generalizations. And secondly, uh, on the idea that, as we saw today, even though there might be situations in which both activities might indeed overlap, such as in money laundering, laundering that is uh, an example that was given, uh, we're talking about two very different phenomena. And uh, they follow different logics, and they many times will demand uh, distinct solutions. Uh, so the second word of caution would be on, on the idea that recognizing the interlinkages of terrorism uh, and international organized crimes in some contexts should not equate to conflating or mixing the concepts that are very, very different. And as our Argentinian uh, ambassador said, they, are, they have very different uh, legal uh, implications and uh, legal frameworks. Um, I'll have two questions. Um, the first one uh, to uh, Ms. Flores Kin uh, on how to reconcile uh, the, this possible interlinkages with the very different legal frameworks that regulates both terrorism and transnational organized crime, particularly in the international level. And for the panelists on uh, Latin America, particularly uh, panelist Ms. Sarmiento, um, we're very interested about the data that was presented uh, and would like to know a bit more about the sources of the data that was presented and what kind of in investigative tool or what kind of uh, analysis tool uh, is the OAS using for uh, compiling the data information on uh, these interlinkages? Thank you very much. I thank the representative of Brazil for her intervention. I now, uh, I don't see any more requests, so I will give the floor to our panelists in order to answer the questions and comments. First with Ms. King. Sure, thank you all for the interesting questions. Um, to the first, you know, really about how to sort of break down the traditional silos between uh, law enforcement responses. Um, it is difficult and I don't sit within law enforcement, but it's historically been a challenge that um, these separate elements of our response often don't connect. Perhaps there's a, a lack of trust or a, or a, a competition over ownership over a problem. Um, but certainly, I think when you can identify that kind of shared threat in which it makes sense for both to be targeting it, it really does require breaking down. Whether that's you know, via a joint task force, um, specifically targeted at a threat, and based on a real level of trust between different agencies. And there are ways to, to enhance that. It could be through secondment between agencies and just really greater training and learning about what, what each agency does. And I think within that, financial intelligence, as I've said, remains that common thread that is often underutilized. So really using the kind of national financial intelligence unit as that conduit between the organized crime response and the, uh, the, the uh, terrorist response um, can be a great first step into breaking down those silos. Um, I won't speak too much about the, the point made on criminal finance, um, the kind of criminal past terrorist future side, as I know we're going to hear from um, Rajan later, who really has sort of authored that, that research. But clearly, um, it's, it's an important topic, and, and particularly, you know, coming from the UK and other countries in the West who've really experienced firsthand this intermingling between social networks. Um, and disrupting that through financial intelligence is extremely difficult. Um, as I've already said, often it requires very little money, and we need to just take more attention in understanding what the social factors are that may be driving synergies between the two. And again, that requires you know, really local engagement, local law enforcement responses, and bringing in community and civil sector um, societies as well. 
We've seen how groups, um, terrorist groups can really promote that idea of using your criminal past and your skills as this kind of appropriate way to commit your goals. And you know, using social media as well as was previously referenced is, is a great tool for them. And how, so you know, we need to think about you know, how we can use those same tools against them and really promote counter narratives and create places where these two, these two sort of interconnected places don't feel the need to, to come together. Um, Public-private cooperation, um, that is a big part of our research, so thank you for the question. Um, there are many ways of, of doing this. I think that from the UK's perspective, we have this public-private partnership where we have a legal framework by which information in terms of operations can be shared between specific private sector actors and public sector. Um, but of course, that won't be the case in many jurisdictions. Um, I know at least in the Netherlands, you have a similar provision on the terrorist financing task force, um, which again shares operational information. But I'd also emphasize it doesn't need to be that level of public-private cooperation. In the first instance, there's nothing to stop public and private sectors sitting down together and discussing typologies, discussing best practices, thinking about where they can learn from one another without you know, breaking any kind of data protection or privacy rules in their own country, but really a way of learning and understanding. Because as we've seen, you know, these different actors hold really important bits of the puzzle that together can, can really help understand threats. And that's not just you know, your traditional financial institutions. We've seen you know, small partnerships on an informal basis with tech companies and the, private se and the public sector in terms of learning and understanding the threat. So there are obstacles, there are legal and ethical challenges that need to be understood, but um, we certainly kind of promote the idea that these are a really promising way of preventing uh, financial crime and terrorism. And then just briefly on, on the last question to me, which was kind of reconciling um, this interlinkage given the multiple legal frameworks. And um, it's, it's a huge question and it's not an easy answer. And I think even, you know, my, my point about public-private partnerships and the fact that, you know, we have one in the UK and it's certainly not recognized um, as, as, a, as a standard in other countries shows those challenges. Um, and even you know, defining the problem, different terrorist definitions, different designations, these things will conflict. So um, I'll probably slightly dodge that question and say, um, keep having meetings like this, keep trying to understand the interlinkages, at least at this level, and then breaking it down via country. Thank you very much, Ms. King. Uh, I will give now first the floor to Mr. Belikov. Senor Belikov, tiene la palabra. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Well, a couple of brief comments. One of the problems that I think that we need to tackle, and this refers to a comment that was made on the use of social media, to that we could add the deep net, which is generating all sorts of problems due to the lack of transparency and the difficulty of carrying out true investigations in what's happening in it. I think that we can do very little today with the tools that we have here, but I do think that this leads us on to another debate, and that is whether in counterterrorism and in tackling organized crime, we should continue to accept in some way that these groups impose the agenda, set the agenda, and have uh, that we are simply and always just reacting to them. The recruitment of, by these groups is creating a counter narrative because they are s seeking to recruit and we are creating a counter narrative because we want a different narrative because we don't simply want to respond to them. We simply pose a different game and try to take an initiative to ensure that their initiative narrative uh, builds more stronger resilience and isn't simply going behind the problem and reacting to it. Now with regard to the synergy and what is it that makes a criminal group a terrorist group, well uh, I completely agree that these are two different spheres, they are two specific spheres, but they are two spheres uh, which run, uh, work in the same areas, they uh, take the same resources, 
and the transactions that they carry out are carried out in the same places and in the same way and they are mutually reinforcing so I think that it is it would be helpful to ensure greater coordination among the agencies carrying out these forms of investigations and this brings me on to the uh, quality of data that we have. We do have myriad data, often very poor in quality, but the problem is not with data, but rather with the ability to assess them. And this brings me back to public-private partnerships, and here I would also include academia and think tanks, think tanks that are very... Uh, aren't very involved in this issue and I think that in Latin America we should continue to encourage this form of interaction between the private sector and the academic sector. Now basically that's what I wanted to say and I would insist that this is a very complex varied sphere and if we uh, I believe that terrorism is a part of organized crime that needs special treatment but we but the work of both groups tackling both phenomena is crucial because often we know that the shortcomings in detecting detecting terrorist activities is due to a lack of communication between agencies and in criminal intelligence and terrorist intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Belikov. I now give the floor to Mr. Camargo. Mm. No, just, just to address the question is, and, and just, just to point out something, gathering what, what you have all mentioned here, and, and the thing is that from from our perspective, what we have uh, wanted to point out is that the the link, the particular link uh, that that we have tried to address is that the the groups that sometimes control what the, the groups that control the minds, the group that control those specific activities, they do they do uh, commit terrorist acts. They do commit terrorist acts, and the way to find it themselves, but at the same time to investigate, um, they have been um, addressed, as uh, my colleague here has, has mentioned. Um, yes, sometimes to commit a terrorist act, you don't need uh, a lot of money. Sometimes um, the, the amount of money that these people use and collect is not that big, but in the complete chain of um, of each and every one of these terrorist acts, whether it is a bomb, whether it is uh, just the financing, um, there is a particip there is the participation of the, the the structures and the facilitators of organized crime. Um, so that is kind of the summary, just to not to be repetitive of what you have also mentioned. I don't know if I missed something. That's it. I'd like to thank Mr. Camargo and all of the panelists for their interventions. The comments on this segment, I would like to thank again all delegations for your... Ah, sorry. If, if Ms. Sarmiento is online, there was a question and comment from Brazil addressed to you, so I don't know if you... La señora Sarmiento nos escucha. Ms. Sarmiento, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, I can. I don't know whether you'd rather for me rather if me to prefer me to respond in Spanish or in English. It doesn't matter, says the chair. The Argentine ambassador also raised a question for the OAS. Well, the OAS, as you know, comprises four departments. We have a department against drug abuse, the department for a department against transnational organized crime, and SISTE, which is what I represent currently. Within the programs within the SISTE, 
we responded to the needs and the requests of the OAS members to uh, face up to the complexities that we have in that area. The sound quality is currently insufficient for interpretation. Projectos que están vinculados con eh, el tema de eh, eh, lavado de activos y financiamiento del terrorismo. Hemos trabajado eh, durante varios años en tres regiones, eh, tres subregiones del hemisferio, eh, en, en un programa sobre los riesgos de lavado de activos y financiamiento del terrorismo en las eh, zonas de libre comercio. Eh, y de esta manera, a raíz de todos estos proyectos en los cuales nosotros participamos, eh, SICTE tiene mm, proyectos muy grandes eh, sobre seguridad marítima, sobre seguridad eh, aeronáutica, sobre seguridad de la carga, de la cadena de suministros, de seguridad de documentos. Y a través de todos estos proyectos nosotros obtenemos eh, información a través de todos los, los expertos we have information through all of the experts and through the synergies that we have in our region. Um, and this has meant that we've been able to achieve some of the goals that we face. The sound quality is again insufficient for interpretation. Bueno, en cuanto a la información eh, sobre este tema en particular, Eh, tenemos información en distintos proyectos, mucha de ella está publicada en, en, en la web. Eh, CICAD, el Departamento contra las Drogas, tiene publicada mucha información y estadísticas sobre este tema. Y bueno, eh, próximamente vamos a empezar a trabajar en un nuevo proyecto en Sudamérica que está vinculada con este tema. Así que si quieren contactarnos, eh, no hay ningún problema, nuestra información... Está, nuestro contacto está en la página web de, del CICTE. I thank again Ms. Sarmiento and all our panelists for, a, I think, a very productive uh, discussion. I think, uh, and all, also delegation for the comments and questions. With that, we, we have reached the end of the first session, and we will move now to the second session focusing on West Africa. So I would like to warmly invite the panelists of the second session to the podium. Thank you very much. So it is my pleasure to moderate this second regional session focusing on West Africa. Our first panelists will join us via, via VTC. I would like to welcome Mr. Antonin Tisseron, is international consultant of UNODC, Regional Office for West and Central Africa. You hear us, you have the floor, Mr. Tisseron.
I'm sorry. UNODC, uh, your microphone is on mute. If you could take it off mute, please. Sorry. So uh, thank you, Mr. President, and sorry for this uh, uh, interforum. Excellent, uh, Madam. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to have the opportunity to address you on a very important issue, which is the links between terrorism and organized crime. I'd also like to thank CTED for this invitation. My statement will focus on active groups in the Sahel and in neighboring countries to talk about the involvement of the sound quality is again insufficient for interpretation. Alors ma présentation sera articulée autour de trois thèmes. Premier thème, le financement du terrorisme par le biais de pratiques criminelles. Deuxième thème, les relations entre acteurs criminels et terroristes. Et troisième thème, l'impact de la criminalité organisée sur la lutte contre les groupes terroristes. Alors le premier niveau d'interaction, du moins celui qui, qui revient le plus souvent à l'esprit euh, dans un premier temps, c'est celui du financement des groupes terroristes par des pratiques criminelles. Et à cet égard, on revient assez souvent sur l'implication directe des acteurs terroristes dans le trafic de drogue. Alors, pour commencer sur ce thème, je souhaiterais vous montrer rapidement que les choses sont plus complexes. On parle notamment souvent de 2012, du Mujao, de l'occupation du Normali, en parlant de rapprochement, d'accommandement. Mais il ne faut pas oublier aussi qu'on a, de manière générale dans la région, un mélange de désapprobation, d'hostilité à l'égard des Africains, et même au sein du Mujao, il y a un certain nombre de personnes qui critiquent et qui dénoncent cette proximité avec des présumés trafiquants. Depuis 2013 également, la pression, avec la pression militaire internationale, les groupes... The interpreter apologizes, but the sound quality is insufficient for interpretation. ...fait une priorité qui est celle liée à leur survie, du fait qu'il s'agit de poursuivre et d'étendre la lutte également dans un environnement contraignant. On peut ajouter aussi que la mort de cadres a probablement affecté la façon dont des cellules locales de combattants se positionne face au narcotrafic, se positionne face au narcotrafiquant et se positionne face au revenu du narcotrafic. Donc tout ça pour dire que sur cette question-là, il n'y a rien de figé, on a des choses qui changent, qui évoluent, mais au final, il y a quand même une ligne, une ligne qui demeure, c'est que ces acteurs terroristes sont des acteurs à la marge du narcotrafic et qui ne sont pas du tout structurants. Sur cette question du financement du terrorisme à travers le narcotrafic, il est aussi important de mettre en perspective à travers les autres sources de financement qui ont été identifiées. Alors certaines relèvent de pratiques criminelles, enlèvement contre, ressortissants de, enlèvement contre rançon de ressortissants étrangers, de ressortissants nationaux aussi, petite délinquance pour financer une cellule, pillage et banditisme, beaucoup Haram, mais pas seulement, c'est le cas dans le centre du Mali, avec toujours des interrogations pour savoir si les acteurs agissent en leur nom propre ou au nom de leur organisation. Il y a également des sources de financement prouvées qui ne relèvent pas de la criminalité. On constate un certain nombre de dons, de dons motivés en faveur des groupes terroristes. On vend sa maison, on vend son magasin avant de rejoindre un groupe, ce qui contribue à le financer puisque l'argent est donné à ce groupe. On reçoit aussi de l'argent de personnes qui sont sur d'autres pays, d'autres continents, pour des raisons religieuses, des raisons communautaires. Il ne faut pas oublier enfin que les groupes terroristes se financent également entre eux, notamment lors de la création d'un nouveau groupe pour l'appuyer et ainsi favoriser l'extension de la lutte. Alors, par-delà la question du financement et des pratiques, et c'est mon deuxième thème, les terroristes et les criminels sont deux mondes qui interagissent, deux mondes qui sont même pour eux. Terroristes et criminels cohabitent sur un même territoire, au sein d'une même ethnie, d'une même tribu, d'une même famille, et peuvent, au nom des solidarités, se rendre un, un certain nombre de services. On observe également des acteurs criminels qui entrent en contact avec les groupes terroristes, par exemple autour des libérations d'otages à des fins lucratives. Surtout, il n'existe pas de frontières étanches entre groupes criminels et terroristes, des trafiquants ont été mobilisés pour des attaques, notamment en ce qui concerne la logistique ou en ce qui concerne la préparation d'opérations. Au Burkina Faso également, des mouvements terroristes se sont appuyés sur les bandes criminelles pour s'implanter. 
Les groupes de bandits travaillent alors au profit des groupes terroristes comme sous-traitants ou alliés et des membres de ces groupes euh, criminels rejoignent les groupes terroristes. Plus généralement, les combattants terroristes, du moins un certain nombre de combattants qui rejoignent ces groupes terroristes, ne s'engagent pas uniquement sur des fondements religieux et ils conservent parfois de leur engagement passé, de leurs activités passées, un certain nombre de relations, voire des intérêts dans les trafics, ce qui contribue aussi à générer une porosité entre ces deux mondes, ce monde des terroristes, ce monde des trafiquants, et donc une porosité qui n'est pas seulement en matière de pratique. Troisième niveau de relation, d'interaction entre criminalité et terrorisme, ou terrorisme, euh, concerne, ce troisième niveau concerne l'impact de la criminalité sur l'environnement dans lequel sont actifs les groupes terroristes. La présence d'acteurs et de pratiques criminelles a en effet contribué dans le Sahel à favoriser l'implantation de groupes terroristes, et ce, de deux façons au moins. Au nord Mali, par exemple, au début des années 2000, les combattants du GSPC sont appuyés sur les trafiquants pour connaître les routes du désert, pour se déplacer discrètement, mais aussi nouer des relations et bénéficier de renseignements et puis d'un soutien logistique. L'arrivée de la drogue a également généré des compétitions individuelles et collectives entre différents groupes actifs dans la région, ce qui a nourri des tensions internes et les acteurs terroristes ont pu s'appuyer sur ces tensions internes pour recruter, pour s'implanter. Alors il ne s'agit pas de minorer le poids de tensions politiques non réglées ou de la pénétration de courants religieux rigoristes qui ont contribué à fragiliser la politique et à préparer le terrain pour des groupes se revendiquant de la religion pour prendre les armes, voire même prôner une révolution. Mais la violence qui a été créée par la criminalité organisée a été un des facteurs qui a contribué à générer ce terreau favorable à l'implantation des acteurs terroristes dans la région sahélienne. Ensuite, la proximité de trafiquants présumés avec les appareils d'État nourrit une délégitimation de ces derniers et de leurs représentants au sein d'une partie de la population, ce qui nourrit par extension les discours qui appellent à une remoralisation de l'espace public, à une révolution morale et politique sur laquelle cherchent à capitaliser les groupes terroristes en stigmatisant dans leur propagande la corruption des élites, leur compromission, ce qui s'ajoute aux arguments anticolonialistes. Alors, pour conclure, j'aimerais revenir sur trois points qui me semblent importants concernant ces liens entre terrorisme et criminalité organisée en Afrique de l'Ouest. Déjà, en matière de financement, il existe une pluralité de sources de revenus pour les groupes terroristes. Certaines sont criminelles, d'autres non, ce qui contribue fortement à nuancer l'emphase apportée au lien entre trafic de drogue et financement du terrorisme. Pour le dire autrement, il convient de garder à l'esprit les autres sources qui sont observés dans la région, le pragmatisme des acteurs terroristes sur les différents territoires sur lesquels ils sont présents et actifs. Deuxième point, deuxième remarque conclusive, groupes terroristes et groupes criminels sont imbriqués autour de considérations plurielles. L'autre est une ressource, une variable avec laquelle il faut composer par opportunisme et pragmatisme. Les solidarités également, la religion commune, les appartenances à une même ethnie, à une même tribu, à une même famille, mais aussi à un autre niveau, la pluralité des motivations inhérentes à l'intégration dans un groupe terroriste, tout cela nourrit une porosité entre ces deux catégories qui ne sont pas étanches. Enfin, cette porosité renvoie in fine à la question de la convergence. Je ne pense pas qu'on se lâche mine vers une criminalisation des acteurs terroristes dans le sens d'un effondrement de l'idéologie des chefs à court et à moyen terme, au contraire, on assiste plutôt à des activités de prosélytisme qui permettent de recruter des criminels qui suscitent une convergence, mais au profit des terroristes en s'appuyant sur les évolutions religieuses régionales, les tensions politiques et sociales et enfin l'hostilité à l'égard des États et de leurs représentants. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Ms. Tisseron, for your presentation. There has been a technical problem that we have been trying to solve during your intervention but uh, with no success. So now we would like to welcome, if he hears us, Mr. Isaka Umaru Bubakar, Police General Controller and Director of the Central Office for the Repression of Illicit Drugs Trafficking in Niger. Ms. Mr. Bubakar. Bonsoir, monsieur. Will, uh, bonsoir. Will, will join us via phone. You, you have the floor, you can start. Je peux commencer, merci. Je voudrais commencer par me présenter, je suis le... I'm the controller general, my name is uh, Isaac Aboubacar. I'm 
I'm the general director of the uh, region for for drug control. Sorry, once again, the interpreter apologizes. The sound is insufficient for interpreting. J'ai participé pendant huit ans à des opérations de maintien de la paix des Nations Unies, notamment au Timor Oriental, au Burundi et en RDC. Hello. Mr. Bubaka, my apologies. We're going to interrupt for the moment to see if we can improve the sound quality, and we'll go to our next speaker and we'll try to reconnect oh. with you. D'accord. Yeah, so we will welcome... Hello, could you spell? Now, Major Chidi Ebom, okay. Legal Advisor of the Lake Chad Basin Commission. You have a blo the floor, Mr. Ebom. The Distinguished Chair Counterterrorism Committee, Honorable Members of um, the High Table, Distinguished Audience, I, like um, I've been introduced, I'm the Legal Advisor to the Chad Basin Commission, and I'm coming from um, Africa, and the last time I came here as um, a prelude, I was the only one on this table, and um, I felt intimidated. <laughs> and today again, it has uh, happened that way. Um, whatever it is, I, the Latin says, um, Fiat Justicia Rot Colum. For those who understand Latin, I am from Africa. I understand it says, um, uh, justice must be done even though the heavens uh, fall. So I must represent um, the Lecture Basin Commission um, to the best of my ability, and even the region. Um, the issue of um, organized crimes and that of um, terrorism has um, actually been addressed by uh, the previous um, um, speakers. The concepts have been treated, and so I wouldn't bother myself to go into the dis definition of the organized crimes and that of um, the terrorism. Um, the next thing I have to do is to tell you how we in the lecture basin has been um, encountering it, the steps we, are, we have been taking to ensure that um, it does not go beyond us, and the reasons for um, this nexus. We are going to take Personally, I'm going to take a different um, perspective from what I have heard. To us, there is no difference or no, um, no separation between organized crime and that of um, terrorism. We are going to have it as three steps. Pre-action, the action itself, and the post-action. What we saw as organized crimes like human trafficking, uh, arms, running, um, kidnappings, um, armed robbery, and um, crimes of that nature are preparatory from our own jurisdiction. They are preparatory to um, terrorism. Um, why do we say that? When those things become so um, high in scale, you discover that those are the steps they will take to raise funds to be able to carry out the terrorism itself. And then, if you look at the, what has happened in um, Lake Chad Basin, uh, we all know that Lake Chad Basin was formed in 1964 by four member states of um, Chad, Niger Republic, Nigeria, and Cameroon. Um, their mandate was to manage the Lake Chad itself and um, associated issues that arise out of uh, the lake. We also know that the lake itself was um, the sixth largest lake in the world, as at uh, 1960. But as of 1963, it started shrinking. As it, as it is now, it has shrunk up to 1,500 meters from the 20 of square kilometers, as to 22,000 square kilometers it used to be before 1960. And so it became an indicator for terrorism. Because uh, within the Lake Chad Basin, 
the inhabitants, who numbered up to 40 million, um, filled on um, uh, uh, fishing, um, herding, um, and all those things that had to come with um, the presence of the lake. But with the um, shrinking of the lake, they became very vulnerable. And they started moving from that border regions to um, northwest Nigeria. They also moved to Niger Republic that borders, those are the rebellion states. They also moved to Chad and also moved finally to um, uh, Niger Republic. Thus, the shrinking of that um, Lake Chad is fundamental to um, um, terrorism in that region. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves, uh, what are those indicators? Those indicators, are, like I mentioned, are kidnapping. The abductions, arm running, uh, cattle wrestling, uh, wrestling, and arm robbery, even transborder crimes. When these things begin to build up, there is tendency that there's going to be terrorism in little or no time. And so the government has to do something about that. Then what are the causes of these, uh, or the root causes of uh, all these um, um, organized crimes and then uh, ter terrorism? We look at it as um, the poor economy of the, uh, the region. Um, there are certain infrastructure that are not uh, present. Unemployment, too, is part of um, the indicators or part of the consequences of that um, organized crime, and then terrorism as well. We also look at um, corruption. Corruption is also at the base of um, terrorism in our place. Then badly prioritize the policies. Again, you have the porous borders. Now, if you look at um, the genesis of um, the Boko Haram in Nigeria, you discover that um, they started you know, with kidnappings. They started with um, um, extremism. For instance, religious extremism. But they, those ones were on the net. Nobody saw them. Okay? They used it as a way of recruiting their um, armed groups and all that. So um, I know I don't have enough time. I would have been in depth. Then what are the consequences? The consequences are not far-fetched. You have uh, the national insecurity, which we have now. You also have uh, the regional and global insecurity, because when one part, of the, or one part of the globe is suffering, it also filters in the other part of the globe. Then you have, um, it gives this way for underdevelopment. It underdevelops the affected areas. Now, what next? The next thing we need to solve now is the, the effects. The effects of organized crimes in the fight against um, um, Boko Haram or um, organized crimes. The financial support of the, of, for terrorism, attraction of other elements, especially on, um, unemployed youth. Then we have um, the displacement of communities. As it is now, those 40 million inhabitants of the Lake Chad region have now been displaced. Most of them are IDPs, internally displaced persons. And then um, you have the threatening of terrorism and uh, networks and militarization of uh, the region. As it is now, um, the terrorists have um, a way of communicating and recruiting their, um, um, their uh, cohorts. However, in Lake Chad Basin, we have also introduced a way of reducing the narrative painted by the terrorists. We have a radio, a radio network now, we call it um, Dandakura. Dandakura Radio assists us greatly to go in depth into the communities, to speak with them in their local languages, to be able to discourage them from um, the narratives painted by the terrorists. Um, again, we have um, the efforts of LCBC towards addressing these terrorism and organized crimes. Um, right now, the Lake Chad Basin Commission has what we call the Regional Stabilization Strategy. Those, that's a strategy to ensure that um, the military aspect, which is the multinational joint task force, that has been taxed to you know, restore peace uh, by force in the Lake Chad region, and then ensure that the um, developmental um, aspects of the reg regional stabilization strategy is uh, actualized. I've been doing their work very well. Now, the collaboration and other initiatives, we discovered that um, we cannot do it alone. You need to collaborate. We have what we call the RIFU, that's the Regional Intelligence uh, Fusion Unit, which um, some other persons, uh, in intelligent uh, communities are part of. We also have the CCL, the Coordination and um, 
the, the Center for Coordination and Liaison, they also give us intelligence. We, the um, Niger Republic, which is part of the um, Le Chad Basin, and um, Chad, also part of the Le Chad Basin, are now liaison with the G5 Sahel. The G5 Sahel also um, um, is, um, uh, is a, a regional, it's a regional um, organization that's also fighting along the borders of uh, um, Chad, um, uh, Niger Republic. They are made up of Burkina Faso, you have uh, Mauritania, Mali, Niger Republic, and then uh, Chad. That's, those are in the G5 Sahel. So we have this regional um, uh, coordination to be able to ensure that uh, um, organized crimes are uh, mitigated. Now, we, what are our challenges? The LCBC or the Le Chad Basin Commission have challenges against um, this fight of um, terrorism and organized crimes. Our, one of our challenges is inadequate capacity because uh, we have very porous borders. You know, the border between Nigeria and Niger, very porous. The one between uh, Nigeria and Chad, also not guided properly. The one between Nigeria and Cameroon and all that. So that's a porous border. We also have um, the issue of funding. Um, that's an attempt by um, Le Chad Basin to recharge the uh, Lake Chad from the Congo Basin. That is to say, if it is, re if it is recharged from 1,500 square kilometers it is now, to at least a level that could allow the have a 40 billion inhabitants, at least even if it is 1 million or, 10, or 2 million that comes back to settle, and then they have livelihood, it will still help us to control terrorism in that uh, region. And then um, you have the diplomatic and administrative bureaucracy. Um, also, we have the differences in economic standing and then uh, of the states. If you discover that the four regions or the four states that make up um, the Lake Chad Basin, they are not um, economically balanced. Um, most of the funding that are being done that is done there by Nigeria. And uh, the others also keep helping the way they could help. Then you have lack of unified legal framework. As it is now, as a legal advisor to this um, Lake Chad Basin and that of a multinational joint task force, you discover that when these terrorists are uh, being um, um, arrested, uh, we see it as each of these um, member states are sovereign. And if they are sovereign, you must not, in accordance with international law, you know, intervene into their legal framework. They have a domestic legal framework, uh, which the ICC statute actually um, have guaranteed them. That is the is issue of primacy. But um, finally, we have this... Uh, the suggestions as to how these things could be brought uh, to bear. We have this intrastate cooperation because these things come up from the domestic regions. Then there should be that cooperation there. There should be interstate too, interregional cooperation and then intercontinental cooperation, just like we have here now, the global uh, security cooperation. And then so you share intelligence and then technology transfer. Secondly, recharging of the lake is very, very important. If we recharge the lake, many of the displaced uh, um, population will come back. And by the time they come back, they will not become easy prey for recruitment, for organized crimes and then terrorism. They will also have the formulation of a legal framework. If we are, we are looking at having um, something like a tribunal, if it is possible, at the center, because we have the multinational joint task force that coordinates the activities of these uh, four countries that make up the Lake Chad Basin. So if we have something like an inter, inter, an, 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 um, one single um, tribunal that tries each suspect, because right now, each country tries their own, and there's no equality and there's no equity in their trial. Now, we'll have the development of the area through the implementation of the uh, regional stabilization strategy. Um, I think for time, um, thank you very much, and um, I agree with you. Thank you, Major Egbon, for your intervention. I've been informed that we still have this technical problem for translation in all the languages, so I excuse myself with uh, Mr. Buakar, so maybe if he can make a very short summary of his, if he can, if you can read your intervention, we'll try to have this uh, translation. D'accord, je peux, je peux commencer? Oui, si vous pouviez vous, si vous pouviez ri, euh, lire la présentation pour faciliter le travail des interprètes, je vous remercie. D'accord, d'accord, d'accord. Merci okay. beaucoup. Je peux commencer Oui, allez-y. Donc, je voulais dire, euh, pour commencer, que le prix du... 
Here's some from the Sahel. Uh, 5,090,725 square kilometers is the uh, area of, that I re am representing. With an estimated population in 2015 of 135 million people. But it's a very vulnerable group. Because of the porous borders. Which are not, uh, there are no obstacles for the different uh, types of traffickers. And they're able to cross the borders easily. Drugs, weapons, cigarettes, and different types of migrants. Uh, pharmaceutical goods and other goods. Uh, where uh, this is a country that is under the siege of different types of drugs. And with a growing population. Monsieur Isaka, s'il vous plaît. Vous pouvez parler quand même un peu plus vite. Hein. L'interprétariat se fait. Si vous, si vous lisez la, la, votre présentation, ils, ils seront en mesure, avec votre, le rythme normal, ils seront en mesure de pouvoir vous, euh, vous suivre. Merci. D'accord. Donc, vous me demandez de parler plus vite. Vous pouvez parler à votre rythme normal et juste lisez, le, lisez le, votre présentation. D'accord. Donc, je disais que c'est... The, these countries have several things in common. Uh, there are languages, and nomad ethnic groups that are the same. With all, with all, it's the same situation uh, throughout the different countries of the Sahel. Uh, each country has a transnational uh, di dimension, a criminal dimension. Promoted by terrorist activities. Which uh, goes beyond, transcends the abilities of the security and administrative apparatus of each country. Uh, the characteristics of the uh, Sahel drug uh, networks are the following. The vulnerability of the different countries because of the porous borders. Uh, and that in some of the territories of these countries there is a total, almost total lack of state authority. which uh, exposes them to this uh, uh, penetration on a more and more acute basis. And the, uh, grim the criminal groups are growing in uh, number and influence. Uh, the interpreter apologizes. The quality of the sound is still insufficient. Et à des groupes armés non étatiques qui ne sont pas forcément classés groupes terroristes. Et à des groupes armés non étatiques. Je peux continuer? Euh, non, je, malheureusement, je crois que la, la qualité, la qualité de la traduction est. est euh, nous avons du mal à vous entendre vraiment. Donc euh, les interprètes n'arrivent pas à vous entendre. Je crois que malheureusement, oh, nous allons devoir euh, euh, suspendre votre intervention, mais, mais nous allons mettre à la disposition euh, des participants de la réunion une copie, de votre, euh, une copie de votre texte et de votre présentation, et nous excusons vraiment pour ces, euh, euh, pour ces, pour ces ennuis techniques qui, ont, euh, qui vous ont empêché de, de, de présenter, de faire votre présentation. Donc vraiment désolé, mais nous allons devoir euh, vous interrompre. D'accord, bon... Euh 
c'est dommage, mais vous pouvez partager avec également euh, l'expert au NIDC qui seront qui est avec vous, avec lequel avec lequel j'ai partagé longuement sur, sur les, cette manière de dor, notamment sur le tramadoc. Désolé de ne pas pouvoir continuer ma présentation, madame. Merci. Merci, monsieur Boubacar. Thank you, Mr. Boubacar. Uh, we apologize for this problem. Continue uh, with the segment of uh, interventions and questions from our uh, uh, the floor. So first, I will give the floor to Security Council members you know, for comments and questions. Je donne la parole à I give the floor to the representative of Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My delegation welcomes the holding of this uh, joint meeting on the nexus between uh, terror and crime. I'd like to thank the uh, different briefers for the quality of their statements uh, on these uh, phenomena which are of growing concern. Mr. Chairman, terrorism and uh, organized crime are today phenomena which unfortunately are part of our daily lives and the uh, effects spare no part of the world. Like other continents, Africa overall continues to uh, pay a heavy toll with these scourges which are very persistent and threaten peace, stability and the development of our entire continent. The uh, Sahel region uh, was uh, was presented uh, recently and it's, uh, it's a, it has been a platform for all kinds of trafficking and terrorist activities. Uh, it is a concern for us still. Uh, we fear that uh, the uh, cr criminals are starting to have a critical political and military influence in our region. In fact, these two phenomena which uh, feed each on each other mutually are seriously compromising the development of our states and uh, it's a reason why the international community needs a holistic approach including measures and vigorous me uh, vigorous development measures in order to eliminate the underlying causes uh, which uh, spread these uh, scourges. So my delegation emphasizes the major role played by the UN specialized agencies in the uh, strategy to combat this. We would also note that regional and sub-regional organizations uh, play a preponderant role in this strategy and remain, it's important still to uh, do capacity building operationally in order to provide a better reply to these uh, challenges. Given the gravity of the situation, my delegation emphasizes the importance of international solidarity in encouraging member states to do more to strengthen and coordinate their cooperation in order to uh, improve their capacity building and to uh, take on the uh, financial sources of terrorist groups which are at the heart of this uh, scourge. We reaffirm the need to fight against the poverty and to increase exchanges of information nationally, regionally and internationally. We hope that the debate today will allow us to uh, come up with some ways and thinking that will, might help us uh, better grasp these phenomena so that we can improve our response to these matters as part of a global uh, strategy to combat and prevent. Thank you. I thank the representative of Côte d'Ivoire. I now give the floor to the representative of Equatorial Guinea. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for convening this meeting and thank you for, to the panellists for their contributions. My country, Equatorial Guinea, firstly firmly condemns terrorism in all of its forms and manifestations because it is one of the gravest threats to international peace and security. We note with great concern the impact of the transit of foreign terrorist fighters and how this is reflected in the ability of terrorist groups that operate on the African continent. As noted in the reports of the respective committees, we are also alarmed at the increasing collaboration 
between terrorist groups and organized crime by it by land, sea, as well as with extremist violence. This situation means that we need to underscore two important recommendations. The first is that transnational threats cannot be addressed in an isolated manner. We recognize here the support of the United Nations to support and to face these challenges in Western Africa particularly in the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin. In this context, for greater efficiency, effectiveness and sustainability of the initiatives, we believe that we must ensure that these interventions do not have unforeseen consequences in other African regions. Our second recommendation is that terrorist criminals and armed insurgents should not benefit from illegal markets, drugs trafficking, smuggling in persons and of natural resources or wildlife and cultural goods from the region. But due to the swift technological development in Africa, including e-commerce and mobile technologies, this has particularly been caused by this. Therefore, our proposal is that the African Union sub-regional and regional organizations should concentrate on designing and, if necessary, promoting the initiative put forward, all initiatives put forward to counter-terrorism in Western Africa. Africa and in any other African sub-region. Our collective aim should go beyond simply stopping the immediate threats as well as to prevent preventing them. For that we need to work together to avoid trans con moving these challenges from our region to other regions. That and we must capacity, ensure capacity building to overcome these challenges. This means that we need to form views to ensure that we can have training in countries and regions. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the representative of Equatorial Guinea. On the floor to all participants, if there are any additional questions or comments. If not, I, uh, I ask, would like to ask Mr. Mayor Egbon, if you would like to comment on any particular issue. No, if that is not the case and there are no more questions, uh, we will we have finished our uh, two first sessions of this day and thank all the panelists, participants for being with us and a very constructive engagement. We will see you uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. Thank you very much.